Good evening, and welcome to the Translation Interpreting Institute's 2014 Distinguished Public Talk. In the previous two years, we've been actively engaging the public in Qatar in conversations uh, through our many intellectual events and gatherings. We try to reach out to academics, scholars, uh, students, and professionals, as well as others interested in the areas we cover. The Distinguished Public Talk is a yearly event in which TII's distinguished speaker sheds the light on a new research topic or a current issue in the fields of translation and interpreting and foreign language. The Distinguished Public Talk is a special yearly celebration for TII community, including faculty and students, because they are offered the opportunity to meet and interact with a renowned scholar whose work they teach or study. And this is exactly the case of this year's Distinguished Public Talk. This year's distinguished speaker is particularly special. As a world-renowned scholar and an expert in her field, her name has become synonymous with translation and narrative theory, ethics, and primary textbooks in translation studies. She is a close and dear friend and a supporter of TII. Mona Baker is a professor of translation studies at the Center of Translation and Intercultural Studies of the University of Manchester. She is currently leading the citizen media at Manchester, um, as a Manchester initiative. She is the author of, in other words, a, co a course book on translation and translation and conflict. And the editor of the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, Critical Concepts Translation Studies, and Critical Readings in Translation Studies. Her articles have appeared in a wide range of international journals, including Social Media Studies, Critical Studies on Terrorism, The Translator, and Target. She is founding editor of the Translated The Translator, former editorial director of St. Jerome Publishing, and founding vice president of the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. Mona's talk today is also of a great interest for the growing importance of subtitling and the many forms through which subtitling proves to play a major role, not just in academia and research or in media, but also in politics. The topic is especially important as we have in TII just launched our second master's program, MA in Audiovisual Translation. This program focuses on the translation of the audio and the visual and the audiovisual material. This includes the dubbing and subtitling of movies, television shows, and other videos. The program also teaches students about subtitling for the deaf and the hard of hearing, audio description for the blind and partially sighted, and the process of adopting websites, software, and video games to the needs of different language communities. The title of Muna's talk today is Subtitling for Protest Movements, Creative Strategies and Political Principles. Her talk will focus on the use of translation in two different but related contexts, the global movement of collective action and the Egyptian revolution. Focusing especially on the Egyptian revolution, the talk will attempt to demonstrate how volunteer subtitling functions in this context and the potential for subtitlers to use more creative strategies and to play a more active role in elaborating a different vision of a just society than can be found in mainstream source of information. It is my pleasure today to introduce Professor Mona Baker, so please join me in welcoming her. Thank you very, very much, Amal, for this uh, warm introduction. And uh, this works, okay. Um, I want to say that I am um, really uh, pleased to be back in Doha, um, and particularly as a guest of TI, TI, uh, TII, the Translation and Interpreting Institute, is um, something that I have watched grow uh, from a small seed of an idea in Amel's uh, head two and a half years ago, three years ago, to what is now a very, very impressive development by, by, by all accounts, really. I hadn't been he back for two and a half years, and I'm very impressed by what I've seen so far. So it's very good to be back again and to witness this uh, growth in interest. And I think two years ago, we couldn't have had as many people interested in translation in Qatar fill a room like this. It's, it's really a measure of the success of TII. Uh, that this is the case, unless um, Amal has threatened you all to attend otherwise. I'm assuming you're here because you are interested in translation. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is based on a research project that I'm currently involved in. I'm currently on research leave 
uh, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in uh, the UK. Uh, to study uh, the use of translation, but very specifically subtitling in the context of the events that unfolded in Egypt since uh, January 2011. Um, and before I say more about this, I should also say that this has not grown out of nothing. Uh, it builds on work that I have done before uh, in the past three or four years. Uh, where I focused on the use of translation in protest movements that are global in orientation. And particularly, um, it's used by groups of people who identify themselves as translators in order to intervene in political developments. So, um, for example, uh, the paper I published in 2013 in uh, Social Movement Studies uh, looks at the way in which these groups, um, translator brigades, Translate for Justice is the latest uh, group to be formed. It was formed about two years ago. Uh, Tlaxcala, uh, the network of translators and interpreters for change. Babels down there, which um, is a group of uh, interpreters, over uh, 9,000 volunteer interpreters, who uh, offer their uh, interpreting expertise to uh, promote the work of the World Social Forum. I don't know if this means anything to some of you. Maybe I should explain the World Social Forum is a civil society um, forum uh, platform for where people from ordinary people like us, not connected with mainstream institutions, come together regularly and have done so since 1999, 1998, 1999, to uh, think together about ways in which um, they can, we can, intervene in the kind of and and perhaps slow down if not end altogether the increased corporatization and militarization of our societies so the the world social forum is an ongoing civil society initiative and babels down there um, is a large group of interpreters who go to all these forums wherever they take place around the world and they offer their services free of charge uh, in order to allow people from different parts of the world to come together and talk about how we can change the world and make it the kind of world that we want to live in. So these, what I call global movements, are movements that are not tied to a particular locale. This is what I studied before. So they are not based in Greece or Turkey or in Egypt. They come from all over the world and they address issues that are not specific to a particular region. So issues of the environment, for instance, of increased militarization and so on, constant war, wherever it takes place. Um, importantly, these uh, groups that I studied before, and I will uh, kind of contrast them with the groups I'm studying now in Egypt, um, of course, they are, they're all volunteer and they all uh, revolve around providing translation and interpreting, uh, not specifically subtitling, um, but they, are, uh, they all identify as translators and interpreters. So they all think of themselves as translators and, and interpreters and all the titles of these groups feature translators, interpreters and so on in, uh, in the title itself. As opposed to this, what I'm studying now is what I would call uh, one case study in place-based movements. Place-based means that they are protest movements that are embedded in a particular region in the world and focused on addressing the uh, problems that are specific to that region. Having said that, uh, all uh, political groups around the world now, or, and it's a feature of all global movements, uh, is that they're all connected and they all, as you will see in a minute, uh, see the, the local domestic problems as uh, part of a, gra a greater problem that we are facing worldwide. So the fact that they are place-based, that for example they are trying to address problems in Egypt or in Greece or in Turkey, doesn't mean that they are disconnected from these global movements. So the two, I am, I'm basically um, studying two groups. Um, one is called Mosarin. Um, and they describe themselves as um, Musarin, which is a play on the Arabic words for Egypt, Misr. And so you can read it as Misriyin, if you want to read it as a mis, um, miswritten um, word. 
uh, a play on the Arabic words for Egypt and determined was founded in the wake of Mubarak's fall by a group of filmmakers and activists. They don't describe themselves as translators. They are filmmakers and activists who got together to found a collective space dedicated to supporting citizen media of all kinds. What Mussorin does, this is the larger, much, much larger of the two groups I will be talking about. What they do is that they are, uh, as, as they say, a group of filmmakers and activists. That's the core group. They have had been, they don't do it anymore for obvious reasons. They had been going out on the streets in Egypt in the middle of protests, demonstrations, documenting abuse on the street and then following it up, for example, not just filming the abuse, but perhaps going to a hospital afterwards, uh, interviewing somebody who had been injured in the protests, and then they produce these um, video clips, films, documentary films, which can be anything from one minute to 11, 12, 13 minutes, and they make these films available on uh, various platforms, most importantly, of course, YouTube, because that's the platform that everybody accesses easily, but also Vimeo. Uh, they also have their own website uh, uh, where they put all these um, uh, documentary films and, uh, and where you can download them free. They're active on Twitter, they're active on Facebook in various ways, and they also individually as filmmakers, they go around the world connecting with other movements, showing these video clips, commenting on them, explaining uh, to people what is happening in Egypt. Mosserin has been extremely influential, very influential, not anymore because things have changed, but um, they have been very influential and this is uh, a, a newspaper article uh, published in January 2012 that says that they um, are uh, was it now one of the most popular non-profit channels in the world after just four months of being on YouTube. That's quite an achievement. One of the most watched uh, YouTube channels, non-profit YouTube channels in the world. So they have been uh, very, very influential. Um, two, a year, a year, no, not a year, two or three years ago, the major television channels and, uh, in, in Egypt were um, showing their films. As opposed to uh, Mosserin, uh, there is also the, the, the other group that I'm studying, much, much smaller group, is called uh, Words of Women from the Egyptian uh, Revolution. Uh, this is um, really a very small number of people, two, three people, again, filmmakers or rather activists who learn to be filmmakers in order to engage in a particular type of activism. Uh, whereas the people in Mosserin, most of them are actually filmmakers, filmmakers, you know, in their own right. Some of them award-winning award filmmakers. For example, they include, you will know the name, I hope, uh, Khaled Abdullah, who, uh, who played the lead role in, um, what's it called, The Kite Runner, uh, but he also produces his own films. Um, as opposed to that, Words of Women from the Egyptian Revolution, um, which, like Mosserin, uses subtitling very heavily, uh, consists of a very small number, and it's a very focused project. What they do is, uh, or what they have done so far, is find women who, very, very different kinds of women, who have been involved in the Egyptian revolution, and interview them in order to document how they participated in the revolution, and how their participation influenced them as, as people afterwards, how it changed them. And this is, of course, in order to, the agenda is to challenge the kind of patriarchal narratives of the revolution that suggest that the revolution was led and mainly uh, affected by, by men, whereas, in fact, women have been very, very uh, involved in the Egyptian revolution. You will see those of you who are attuned to that kind of thing, and something which also causes problems, a lot of problems in translation, is that they play uh, a lot on... Um, internationally uh, known uh, plays on words in the feminist context, at least. So her story to remind history. Um, that's something that they haven't so far managed to translate in any of their videos. They translate everything else into, uh, into Arabic where they have titles and so on, but not this one. It just seems to have challenged uh, the best of them, and that bit is not translated. So these are the two uh, collectives that I'm studying. They both rely very heavily on subtitling. Uh, all, everything they do is subtitled into English by volunteer subtitlers. All this work is volunteer. Uh, they subtitled into English as a matter of course, 
And then beyond that, it may be subtitled into other languages depending on the availability of volunteer subtitlers. In the case of Words of Women from the Egyptian Revolution, because um, the guy who set it up, Leil Zahra Murtada, uh, was based in Spain and knew Spanish, uh, and all the videos uh, in the series are subtitled into Spanish as well. But beyond that, it depends on the availability of subtitlers. Now, in studying these uh, two groups, and I will tell you in a minute what kind of issues I was trying, I'm, I'm still trying to focus on because I'm still doing it. Uh, in um, studying these two groups, I uh, relied on a number, a range of sources. Uh, first of all, I interviewed the people involved, most of them, myself. So the interviews that I did were a major source of the kinds of things I'm talking about today. And um, I interviewed not just the filmmakers, but also subtitlers, some of them. There's a lot of uh, kind of uh, overlap. So some of the filmmakers, although they never think of themselves as subtitlers or translators, actually did some of the subtitling. But on the whole, the subtitling is done by volunteer uh, translators who don't think of themselves as filmmakers and don't get involved in the filmmaking. And I've interviewed both types. So that's one source of data. Another source of data, of course, are the videos themselves and the, subtitled, uh, the subtitling into English, because I don't have access to the other languages. Other people can study that, but I can only look at the English subtitles. So uh, the videos themselves, and, and uh, there are a lot of them, particularly Mussorin, uh, is very, very prolific. I mean, you're talking about maybe 200 video clips at least. Thirdly, uh, there is uh, published material on both groups. Uh, and including published interviews. So some of the filmmakers in Mussorin, for example, have been interviewed by various activist magazines and mainstream magazines, and I use these published interviews as well to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. And finally, there is a, a discussion list, a mailing list, that is specific to subtitlers in Mussorin. So Mussorin, because it's very big and produces an awful lot, or produced an awful lot, of um, films that had to be subtitled very quickly because you can imagine that the kinds of things they were documenting were very fast-paced events. And there's no point in waiting two weeks before you release a subtitled version. By then, it's old news. So uh, they needed to coordinate the subtitling. It was very important to connect with people abroad and to nurture networks of solidarity. So they came up with the idea of having a mailing list to coordinate the work of the volunteer subtitlers. So one of the sources I'm, I'm using as well um, is, the, is this mailing list. Now, when I interviewed them, of course, uh, they already knew what I was doing. I had to explain. Ethically, you have to explain to people why you're interviewing them uh, and what you're trying to, um, to research. So they already knew uh, what, I was uh, what I was doing. And after a while, thankfully, they trusted me enough to allow me onto their mailing list. So I joined the mailing list. They knew I was joining it specifically because I'm interested in finding out how they do what they do and and so on. Uh, but I also, as part, and I think this is something that may interest those of you who uh, are interested in the research side of things, um, in part also because I wanted to get a better feel for how things work by volunteering myself to do within limits, because I'm not because I didn't want to do more, but because I had very limited time, I actually volunteered to do a couple of, um, of videos. So I also uh, worked on that a little bit. So these are the sources that I used in order to uh, look at subtitling in place-based movements using the Egyptian context as, uh, as my case study, if you like. And the issues that I'm um, trying to consider and that I want to consider today, uh, of course, I'm considering more than that in the project, but these are the main things I want to talk to, uh, about today. First of all, you need to establish the nature and aims of the political project for which the volunteer translation or subtitling is being done. And this, although I am interested in protest movements, and this is what I'm focusing on, I would say that the same applies to any kind of uh, research on translation. If you don't understand the context in which the translation or interpreting or subtitling is being done, and what people are trying to achieve from it, then you're going to miss the point, really. You're going to be uh, dealing in abstractions that don't help anybody. So. 
I'm trying to understand the nature and aims of the political project, and I will talk about that in a minute. I'm trying to understand the place of subtitlers in this project and how they are positioned vis-a-vis -vis other actors. You know, in filmmaking and, and in, in collectives like this, you have all sorts of people. You have the filmmakers, you have editors, you have people who help with the logistics, maybe carry a camera around for somebody to do the filming. Um, you have all kinds of people. How are subtitlers positioned in, in, this, in each project? And uh, because importantly, this positioning, as I will try to show, has an impact on how the subtitling is done and is done and what kind of decisions are made. Um, I'm interested in looking at the tension between the global and the local in these uh, projects. Um, all the people I've interviewed for Mosserin, for example, have said very clearly that their priority is the domestic audience. What they're trying to do is to effect change locally. So they're trying to reach people locally. That is the priority. Uh, at the same time, they also say that we know we are part of a global system and we need solidarity from abroad and we need people to understand what we're doing and what is going on and not just rely on uh, what is given to them in mainstream uh, news outlets. And so they also have to understand and the hence subtitling and translation. Now, there is a tension between these two because the local events are very fast paced. They require uh, people to follow them all the time in order to understand each of the films. And, uh, and if you make too many concessions, then you're going to be addressing more of a global audience. Even the language that is used um, can sometimes uh, 